I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Dennis Lehane, I think we're what? This is the 15th book you've done, Small Mercies? It's the 14th. 14th. I feel like it's the 14th novel. Okay, so 14th novel, more than 10 million copies of your books in print worldwide, more than 37 languages that you've been translated into. You might be the first Bostonian writer who's been translated into that many places. So thank you for getting, (laughs) thank you for getting us in front of people. Okay. It feels like that's more than most. Arthur Golden's memoirs of Geisha. Uh, Oh yeah. Okay. Right. He's Bostonian. Okay. Okay. Fine. But hey, Small Mercies and Mary Pat Fennessy, who is a fabulous character. She's amazing. She might be my favorite of your characters. And I was not expecting to love. Yeah, I know. It's pretty crazy. I was not expecting to love her. (laughs) And she's great. She's a very complex character to write. She's a somewhat repentant racist, but she's a knowing racist. And the journey of the book, in a lot of ways, is is her coming to terms with how much damage that racism has done. Um, So you don't want to say, oh, it's a happy story about somebody who lives and learns that being racist is bad. But it's, it's, it's a multitude of things. She has other qualities. She has qualities that are admirable. She has other qualities that are very much not admirable. And that made her a really fun character to write. Small Mercies is set in Boston in 74, right? Mm-hmm. As the busing decision has been handed down and, and schools need to be desegregated. The community did not respond um, quietly. We will get into a lot of that. But this feels like your most personal book to date. It feels like you went places in your own head that maybe you haven't necessarily gone before. And I say that because there's a BNN exclusive edition that has an essay that you wrote specifically for this book. And it's a really powerful riff. And obviously we're not going to give you the entire essay because this is coming out the day the book releases. But I do want to talk about what it was like for you to decide to even write this book. It was something I had wanted to write a book about busing for a very long time. Mm-hmm. I felt like it was the it was the seismic event in my life, in my childhood, yeah. certainly. And you know, Cormac McCarthy has a has a a bit, and I believe it's in The Crossing. You know, there are events that divide your life into the before and to the after. And that is exactly what busing did for me and did for the city. The city was never the same ever again. The reputation of the city was never the same. So it was something I wanted to write about, wanted to write about. And then I'd, I'd taken a couple of cracks at it uh, to tell a different type of story. And then somehow this idea popped in my head about a type of woman that I knew growing up. And they were women who tended to be project moms, not all, but most. And they were coming from you know, the bottom end of years, generation upon generation upon generation of alcoholism, of poverty, of violence. And they were tough, tough women. They were tougher than a lot of men. And so when I was a a kid, it was something you'd look at these, you know, like, oh my God, like, (laughs) where could a woman like this come from? And then as, because they were fearless, they were, took no, I don't know how many words you could use (laughs) on this podcast, from anybody uh, and they raised kids like that too yeah and so it was it was only as i got to adulthood that i began to realize there's something truly tragic in these women there's something sad that, that you don't a happy life doesn't create a person like that and mary pat is this fearless the first image i ever had of her which is early in the book she even references that is is as if something of a woman she was born looking like she came ready to try out for a roller derby. Yeah. Like, you know, and that's, and that's who she is. And when she's unleashed in this book, when she's given nothing left to lose, I found, found that fascinating. What's this woman going to be like when people try to put a stop to her? Your editor Noah said in an early pre-pub interview that it was the mystery of small mercies that really sort of had his attention at first. And I remember when I first heard about this book, I was like, I need to see how he pulls this off. I need to see how we can talk about busing. I mean, Common Ground, obviously, the J. Anthony Lucas book yes. is sort of the, it's the standard bearer. I it's mean, the benchmark, man. it, it the benchmark. won the Pulitzer for reasons. It is one of the best books out there, just hands down, whether it's about busing. Or, it is an amazing, amazing book. But I also sort of feel like there's not necessarily a ton of overlap between the folks who have previously read that book 
but I really, really want them to pick up Small Mercies because this book has this big beating heart mm-hmm. that when you're yeah. writing history, you don't always get to do, right? I mean, he digs in on the people too and he follows, you know, the three different families. And the consequences and the stakes are high. Like everything is so loaded in Small Mercies and yet I'm flipping through the pages and mm-hmm. I'm really entertained. And I'm a little horrified slightly because I'm entertained because I know what the background of this story is. So when you're breaking down the book as you're yeah. writing it, you start obviously with Mary Pat fantasy. Cause I mean, there is yeah. no about Mary Pat. Yeah. There's a character that some might gravitate towards in a second and say, Oh, hello, Whitey Bulger. <laughs> there is, yeah. there is a dude where it's like, okay. Yes. There's, okay. there's a lot of history in this book. Almost all of the incidents in the book have a basis somewhere. In fact, but do you go straight to plotting it out? I mean, you've talked in the past about how, you know, story is the thing that drives you more than anything. But this book is so character driven. No. Oh, no. I think that's a misinterpretation. Okay, I have okay. to say it's character that drives me. Story. Okay, good. good, good I good. love story yeah. because I think story is the journey. Character is obviously the people involved. Yeah. Plots the car. Yeah, yeah. And my my to my detriment, it's clear that I'm not in love with plot all that much. I I do it because I have to. I teach it because it was never taught to me. I know that that's what people come to a book for, but man, that's the last thing I'm interested in. Okay. I always bring up a scene in Clockers as by Richard Price as my scene, and it's two guys sitting in the bowels of a housing development police. Uh, office yeah, yeah. And, and all they do for eight pages is talk about mm-hmm. nothing but <laughs> anecdotes the yep. stories that they tell each other and they're hilarious and on the wire we used that scene repeatedly we loved that scene that's what i want to do i would just rather have people you know just wandering around chat and there's so many scenes in this book of people just wandering through the city talking like that's that's what i love but this journey the journey is very important because the journey is going straight through the heart of the summer that did it. When I think of all I see is fire. I just see fire and, and rage and, and heat. That's what I recall. And so I, I, I wanted to put a woman right at the center of that and run her right through the buzzsaw of all of it. You know, the, what was going on really on the streets in South Boston in 1974 in August. You were that was nine. Perfect. That's a long time to carry that story around. Well, as I say in the in the afterward in, in the mm-hmm. Barnes and Noble version, this was a coming to terms with a mystery that had sat at the heart of myself for forty something years, which was where was this anger in me had, mm-hmm. had come from? Because I was not um, I had a, I had a wonderful you know upbringing. I had mm-hmm. uh, two you know I had two parents in the home. I had a very nice home. They were immigrants who wanted their children to do well. So it wasn't like, like I knew of this world in the, you know, that would give me a a type of fury that drives my books. I mean, you can feel it in all my books. You don't feel it much in me as a person. I mean, that's the weirdest thing is when people meet me, they're always like, you're funny. Like they were just amazed by it, you know? And um, I felt writing this book, It was, oh, that's what I'm angry about. That's what I'm so mad about. Instead of having your childhood taken from you by abuse or by a horrible act or by incredible Mm -hmm. loss at a really deeply personal level, I felt like my childhood was taken from me by the events of the summer of 74. I was never the same kid after that. I never looked at adults the same way after that. I was like, you're going to talk to me about morality and then go pick up a rock and throw it at a bus full of school kids? I'm going to see you in church? Like, I just couldn't reconcile the two things. And I could finally chart something, which I've always had a lifelong mistrust of mob think or fanaticism. If your ideology allows for you to murder people, for you to allow people to be just slaughtered, for you to allow rocks to be thrown at children, Mm -hmm. then you're off my Christmas card list. I got nothing to say to you. Then, And I feel like, unfortunately, that's a lot of the world or at least a lot of the world who eats up the news cycle. It feels like we've gone back to that period. I mean, I am a little bit younger than you, and my memories of that time in that neck of the woods, it's a little later, 
Mm-hmm. Certainly, sure. but it's not like everything got resolved by right. Christmas of 74. It's not like things were normal by 70. Like, and normal actually isn't the word I should use. You, but, had a whole, you had a whole sub-generation of kids who never went to high school. Yeah. That's how long that boycott lasted. Yeah. It's, it wasn't it, like, you know, it, the boycott that's shown in the book is shown on September 12th, day one. Right. That boycott went on for years and years yeah. and years. There was an entire subgeneration that never got education. There are people who talk about, you know, Boston's sort of legacy of city on the hill and all this other kind of stuff. And I can't separate busing from the city. I, I, sim- I, I, I can't. And, you know, I grew up in the burbs, but I cannot separate that entire moment from the city's history in any way, shape or form. But that is what was so horrible about what what the suburbs did to the city. To be honest, the suburb this was supposed to be, a, it was supposed to affect all the counties. It was supposed to be Middlesex. It was supposed to be Suffolk. It was supposed to be all the counties in Boston. And at the last minute, it was two months before poor, poor Arthur Garrity had to make that. And all Garrity did was follow the law. Yeah. Two months before he was set to make that decision, they said, "Actually, we don't let the city hold the bag on this one. We're out." Integration desegregation will not affect the schools outside the city. And so what that did was that triggered, and again, there is no excuse, absolutely none for the racism. That's not what I'm saying. But there is a context here, which is the neighborhoods were so used to everybody coming in and saying to them, we don't we don't care what you want. We can do it anyway. So Dorchester, where I grew up, I was shocked to find out how close I grew up to the ocean when I was a kid. And then found out later, how much anger there was that they dropped the Southeast Expressway straight through our neighborhood and cut us off from the ocean. And, and f- there's this huge mistrust fermenting in all the mid- all the lower class neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, I remember going to high school with kids who were bust in on the Metco program, and I, was, I just felt so bad that they spent forever on a bus right. to come to high school with us. And like they had to leave on like... In order to get home, like yeah. not a lot of kids could do sports because the bus left before. It was really just. It was a disaster. And yet everybody uh, could go and feel like, oh, well, we did the right thing. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You know, desegregation, it's said very clearly in the novel, desegregation had to happen and it had to happen right then. It was just as delayed for far too long. Desegregation was an unequivocal good. Busing and the way it was implemented is a whole other issue. I mean, I lived in a redlined community, without a doubt. Like, I right. grew up in a place where <laughs> I was the pigment until high school. And then suddenly yeah. I had other classmates. You know, there was like a Korean-American family, and my brother had a classmate who was Black and adopted by white parents. Like, that's how white my community was. Yeah. NIMBY, NIMBY is a racist policy. Yep. You can call it any other yep. thing you want. But at the end of the day, it's a racist policy that is often instituted and enforced in good liberal neighborhoods. And it's like, you don't want bus lines. You don't want train lines. You don't want people to be, you don't want any public transportation. So you can't let any poor people in. And poor people means people of color. And so there was an inherent hypocrisy that, you know, my father felt. My father was not racist, but my father was just like, it's not, it's not fair that they're doing this again, was the way he looked at it. But he wasn't. Then, then what you saw was the people who felt that and were already racist. You put that together, that's kerosene on top of a fire. And that's part of what you're talking about in Small Mercies. I mean, yes. there is, it's a Dennis Lehane novel. Unfortunately, a very bad thing happens. But the way you unfurl the events of this story and the people you bring in and the people you take out and the people you bring mm-hmm. back in, how much of a roadmap do you have when you're sitting down? Because obviously, like we have just talked about a very significant, nuanced, very messy, very complicated. People were well-meaning, but a lot of people got hurt. And that's not even getting to the racism, right? Like we're yeah. just literally yeah. talking about like piles and piles of legal paperwork. But you as the writer, you've got to create the world. You've got to create the characters. You've got to create the story. How much of this are you mapping out? And how much None. of it is just you sitting down? Okay, so you're just None. sitting down and going and saying, all right. I. I knew I had a through line. 
I knew mm-hmm. what my through line was. There's some antecedents to this story. I'd heard about a, a mother in Mexico who took on the cartels um, over the death of her daughter. I'm speaking more of the film than of the book. I, I'm, I'm a be- very big fan of a film called Get Carter with, with Michael Caine. I think that was that was an antecedent as well. And then there was just this, it was a sense of, I keep coming back to this image of like driving something through a buzzsaw, driving something through a wall. Yeah, yeah. I was saying, I want to drive this straight through the summer of 74, right up till September 12th. And I want mm-hmm. to tell the story of a woman who cannot be bargained with, cannot be negotiated with. She is going to find out where her daughter is, mm-hmm. no matter what. And she is going to hold every single person accountable who may have been involved in the disappearance of her daughter. And that was just like, man, that's a rocket ship. You don't need much plotting after that. You know, it's sort of like just A, B, C, D, E, who who pops in? The surprise with this book for me was the introduction of the male character. He came seven chapters in, I think, and then was supposed to walk back off stage. He was never supposed to come in again. And I realized that at that point, I needed balance. I needed I needed some light with the dark because the book in the middle gets pitch dark. And so. I needed something that was going to to balance that, maybe show us another point of view, maybe show us another type of life that was going on in the early 70s. And, and so that became Bobby Coyne, who's the detective. And he became this great little, there was a, there's a friendship that develops mostly over the phone between him and Mary Pat. And I, and I love it. It's the heart of hope in the middle of the novel, I think. And I also bought into it. I bought into these. These two characters would have actually connected. They may not like what each other represents or is doing, but they certainly understand. Mm -hmm. And it's a legit relationship. I mean, I had a moment when when you first brought Robbie in and I was just kind of like, okay, here we go. He was not totally what I was expecting. And then Bobby goes to a meet. Bobby, it turns out, is a is a recovering heroin addict on top of being a police officer. And he goes to a meeting. And that was another surprise. I never expected him to walk out of that meeting. He just became, what Bobby became was hope. Mary Pat's run is just, you know, it's a descent to hell. I mean, she's on, you know, she's on a a certain rail system and the brakes are off. Where Bobby represents something, some type of light in the book, if you will. Hearing you talk about Mary Pat's sort of path, I had a suspicion that she was going to become a force of nature in a different way because she's already, you know, who she is. I would follow her anywhere. I really would. I I just like, she's so grounded and she's so clear and she's actually very funny. And I don't think she gets credit for being funny. She's very funny. I really appreciate that because she's just not like the stuff that comes out of her mouth. Sometimes I'm like, if I were eavesdropping on that conversation, I would get hit by someone because I would be laughing so hard that. Right. 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 You know, you'd be getting stink eye from. Someone yeah. down the road. There's an inevitability, though. Even though you put a lot of hope into Small Mercies, there's an inevitability. And there's some other characters I'm thinking of, too, like Dreamy and her husband. And there's a scene towards the end that I was kind of waiting for. Yeah. Because, you know, the sort of looking for absolution. <laughs> no, it's not coming. There is a trope in film and in some mm-hmm. books where it's kind of like, the first thing is, oh, you're a racist, but B, you're a good guy underneath, yeah. you know? And I'm like, I don't need to be told that. Like, I don't, you know, what Mary Pat is, is a, is a mess of things. And she mm-hmm. doesn't get off the hook for her racism. That was really important to me. That there'd never be a moment where it's kind of like, oh, but now you've lived and learned. You know, no, no, there was a legacy. You, you did a lot of damage. And you did a lot of good. And Bobby says it, I think, the most succinctly, which is probably my worldview. He says, you know, the worst of us has good in him. And the best of us has has depths of evil you can't even imagine. Like it's it's I'm paraphrasing, but that's that's the point. And that's the duality of 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 all people. I feel like we used to know that now this just uh, I don't know. This is this this you must be a binary binary thinker in this world right now. Yeah, it's broken. It's broken. Um, And that's partially why I keep coming back to how much I liked Mary Pat as a character. I was really surprised. I was just really surprised. And I'm also really grateful that you didn't put in that moment where she's sort of 
redeemed, but she's sort of expecting to get a pat on the head. That is, again, that's that sense of she has, this has been overused, this phrase, but, you know, Mary, Mary Pat within her own poverty stricken world has privilege. And that's what she expects. She expects, well, hey, if I just kind of apologize, then these African-Americans will, of course, they'll, they'll celebrate me, you know, yeah. and and it's like, no, they won't. You know, she gives a speech near the end. It is very much a monologue, but she gives mm-hmm. it to a phone booth in Charlestown. Yeah. <laughs> and she gives that speech. And I, I feel like that's the heart of the entire book and mm-hmm. what she says about about how racism is handed down. You don't meet a four year old. You put a black four year old and a white four year old at a playground. They have no trouble playing with each other. You put those same kids back there at eight. They might. And that's that to me is is clear proof. Racism is taught. It is not innate. It's not innate in anybody. You know, I was wondering if you were going to come back to writing books because it had been a while since since we fell. That was yeah, yeah, seventeen, sixteen, seventeen. It came out two thousand seventeen. It's been six okay, years. Okay, so yes, yeah, so, longest ever. And I mean, you've you've made it clear you're not a book a year guy, and you know, it's always yeah. just nice to get a new book from you. But you've also been writing a lot of television and. Yeah across different i mean you started with the wire and boardwalk empire but then there was a stephen king adaptation like there's been a lot of stuff and then blackbird and then blackbird yeah. last summer and there was something i came across as i was getting the prep done for this show where you said i don't really have a thing for serial killers or jail and yet this is the project you ended up taking on and i just want to go back to that for a second because mm-hmm. i watched all 6 hours I binge watched, completely yeah. binge watched. Yeah. And I can see your fingerprints all over it, having yeah. read the, you know, all sure. of your previous work and whatnot. Yeah. And I can see your fingerprints everywhere. But it was kind of wild to know that you had actually worked off of material that wasn't yours to begin with. And I'm just wondering what that process is like for you. It was interesting at first. I tried to turn the job down like several times because of that right. whole thing. I, I right. just spent, I had literally done back to back to back three Stephen King novels. I love Steve. But that's a dark world to be in, man. I was like, huh, I would love to do Bambi, where mom lives. You know, like, I just, I want something light. I want something fun. And they came to me with this, and I was like, good God. But when I really dove into it, I thought, this can be a really cool thing to say about where you are on the spectrum as a male, in terms of the the, the spectrum that begins with with objectification and ends with pure evil misogyny. Like, the, where are you on the spectrum? Because we're all on the spectrum somewhere. And I thought, oh, okay. And I, I, I want to tell that story. I want to look at, I want to put Jimmy, the Jimmy, my Jimmy, not the real Jimmy. I want to put my Jimmy into this prison. And I want him to go on a journey in which he understands by the end that maybe he's a little more effed up when it comes to how his feelings about women than he thought and also, to I have this thing where a, fr- a friend of mine finally said it. He said, "You specialize in inconvenient discovery of one's humanity. That, that that's that that's one of the things that totally happens to Jimmy at the most inconvenient moment in the world. In this in Blackbird, he discovers empathy, and it's a it's a global empathy. He discovers where he is in the the grand spectrum of life, if you will. And so, I found that story really interesting to tell." And then I wanted to do a story in which you never see the victims be hurt. You never see it. And if the impact of it come totally through the journey that you go into these characters' minds. And then in the end, I also wanted to, as much as I possibly could, take their lives back from the serial killer. And so I dedicated a whole episode to one of the victims and to her life. And the point was to say, this was a life worth living. Larry Hall's life is not a life worth living. Nobody would want Larry Hall's life from birth on. Sure. Part of why I bring that up is also that's the backdrop against which you're writing Small Mercies. You start writing Small Mercies while you're writing and producing. Blackbird. It was crazy. Yeah. How? 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 Writing has always been an escape for me. It has always been my refuge. Okay. And I think suddenly I'm running a TV show. Everything's going wrong. We got COVID outbreaks left and right. We were having daily lightning strikes. It was hot beyond measure. We had personality conflicts. We had all sorts of problems. And I'm trying to run this ship. And somehow in the midst of all of that stress, my refuge became writing a book. I would go home at night and I would sit in this haunted 
Antebellum Mansion and just sit in a chair and I would just write. I, it was crazy. I wrote a lot of it on the front porch, yeah. the second story front porch of this building overlooking the Garden District. It was wonderful. I was always reminded of a story that I that I really understood, not to put myself on this level by any means, but it was a story that creatively I understood, which is Steven Spielberg edited the first Jurassic Park while he was shooting Schindler's List in Prague. Oh, I did not know that. And I thought that makes perfect sense to me. That makes perfect sense. You come home, you've been dealing with Nazis and and genocide, and it and you just say, Oh, let's get on the probably would have been a steam back back then. Let's go on the steam back of the avid Mm -hmm. and start messing around with dinosaurs. Right. Like you need that. A creative I, I do anyway. I needed that outlet. So the book became my outlet. It moves. It was meant to move like a bullet. Yeah, and even your historical novels, I mean, I'm... They don't move like this. They shot out of a slingshot after the first two chapters. It's after the first two chapters, it's relentless. It never stops. So how much of that is rewriting, though? Almost none. So you really just sat down and you said, okay... I just blasted I this thing out, and then okay. I went back and I fixed a lot. Don't get me wrong. I'm yeah, not yeah. a genius, but I, I went back and I I, I shaped some things, I, but it it was chapter by chapter, the book you're reading structurally speaking. And the only hiccup I remember was after the end of act one, which ends at the sugar bowl in South Boston, that there was a moment where I paused and I didn't know my next move. It was the only time. And for, it lasted, I think about three days. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said, what happened to that cop who showed up a couple of chapters back? (laughs) Okay. So Bobby rides in. Okay. And then Bobby came in. And then I got to do this nod to, I have cousins who all lived together throughout their lives in a big old ramshackle house. And I always loved that house. And I always loved the relationships in that house. So I gave them, that's Bobby's family. Okay. And Bobby has a pretty great family. I mean, they're very yeah, they're funny. awesome. <laughs> they're very, they may not all know how funny they are, but they're really yeah, great. They're, as characters. they're, yeah. they're excellent. But yet here you are saying this is your release, right? This is your release from serial killers and jail. And <laughs> I, I murdered know. women, and you go to 1974 Boston. Which do you feel like you have more peace for yourself now that you've finally written this book? Yeah, yeah, I do. I feel like there was a bit of a an expulsion. There's two, uh, there's two things that happen as a parent that I find fascinating. Okay. The first thing is through your children, you end up forgiving your parents for a lot of stuff because mm-hmm. you're like, that's why they snapped. That's why they acted this way. That's why they did because you're like, oh wow, so. Suddenly you're taking the parents' point of view on things. And, and that happens a lot. The strange thing that also happens, the flip side of that coin, is sometimes you don't forgive your parents or you don't forgive adults because you say, I could never do that to a four-year-old or I could never do that to an eight-year-old or whatever. I took my nine-year-old at the time, really wanted to see To Kill a Mockingbird. And we went to see To Kill a Mockingbird. And to see that to, to her, she had never heard some of the words that people were saying. So, I mean, she knew the words, but how casually they would say it. Even Atticus Finch says the N word twice. And to see the effect of it on her, it was kind of like violence. Like it was like, and I was like, what? she and I have very similar personalities. So I was like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. So if all that was dropped in your lap at nine years old, can you imagine what it would be, have the effect it would have on her at nine years old? And I was like, that's not right. And then I got mad. I got really mad. And that drove the book. That fury drives the book. I'm just like, you guys had no right to do this. I don't care about anything else. Any other argument. Nothing justifies throwing rocks at children in buses. It's the bottom line. I know you believe in empathy. And I know Mm -hmm. you believe in hope. Mm -hmm. I know those without question. Do you believe in justice? The first time a rich white guy gets the death penalty, I'll believe in justice. Until then, no. There's a line in, in The Given Day, I can't believe I'm quoting myself, but I remember writing it and going, hmm. Babe Ruth says it. He says, them's that write the checks, write the rules. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true. We're looking at it. We see it mm-hmm. nonstop. So do I believe in justice? Yeah, but I believe it's the exception, not the rule. I think Mary Pat definitely doesn't believe in justice. But she goes get some. She does, but I don't think she believes in it until she gets it. (laughs) 
Yeah. I don't uh, think she, here's the thing. I don't think Mary Pat trusts anyone else to deliver for her. And she has very philosophical conversations with Bobby about that. She's like, why what are you supposed to do? What are you gonna do? He's like, Yeah, he's handcuffed by the rules of law, which Mary Pat is not. You know, there's a I, I think a, it, it's certainly the most shocking moment in the book for most people so far is exactly how merciless she is at one point. Yep. And she just she, to the point where she shocks a bunch of gangsters where they're like, well, we wouldn't go that far, <laughs> you know? So I, w- I wanted that in there. I wanted her to be this person who says, I, you know, I'm an avenging angel and, and what I cannot get in this world, I will take. That made her a wonderful character to write. She's a great character to read. <laughs> She's a really good character to read. You know, one of the things, too, that you talk about in the uh, afterward to our edition is you're talking about some of the writers. You raised Cormac McCarthy early in this conversation, but Toni Morrison was an influence. Graham Greene was an influence. I just want to talk about your influences for a second because it just makes me happy to know that you read that deeply and that broadly, right? You're just a book nerd. Uh, well, I'm a ner- No, I'm an art nerd. <laughs> Okay. Okay. An nerd. And okay. I am like, it, you, people are always confounded by how much I know about the, the broadness of my knowledge of music, broadness of my knowledge of film. My writers group, we get together, the, the writers on my team, we get together every Friday at my house. And I, sh- and I'm, the game is to show them a movie they don't know. And they're all writers. And I've been winning. I've been batting a thousand. Because I can pull B movies out of anywhere. And I think the greatest thing that ever was bequeathed to me that I did nothing for, I have no idea where it came from, is my fascination with any any type of art form knows no elitism, no bias, no anything. It's like, if I can enjoy that, then that's what I want. And that enjoyment may be to watch the Sika's Bicycle Thief, or it may be to watch a Grindhouse Christopher Walken movie from 1988. Like it, whatever it is, I just want to engage it and I want it to wash over me. And that's the truth about books. And that's the truth about music. Taryn and I, Taryn Edgerton and I have been discussing the music that his character is going to be listening to in our next show. Oh, and, that's interesting. Okay. That's really and interesting. And we've been, we've been like texting back, back and forth, like yeah. lunatics, because we're like totally locking in on this. And I, the key to me, I'm like, this guy likes really bad 80s and early 90s pop super bad and then i all of a sudden was like wait a minute i got i found him his song yesterday i'm like i found you your anthem and it was a michael bolton song okay and and he's like how do you even know this song (laughs) like i know everything man you know wait it's public knowledge what the next project is right it's yeah okay so can you just bring people for listeners who may not know what this is can we just tell them what the next thing is? Because when I saw what you were doing, my jaw dropped. And now so knowing that you have the soundtrack figured out, I'm just like, oh, my God. We're having a blast. The new project is uh, there was a podcast called Firebug, yep. which tells the story of John Orr. And John Orr was both the most prolific arsonist in mm-hmm. United States history. He he burned down half of um, Glendale, California in yep. the 1980s and simultaneously was the arson investigator for Glendale. He was the guy chasing himself, supposedly. So we took that story as a launching pad. We moved it up into 2023. We reset it in the Pacific Northwest. We added tons of different characters. And and Taron Edgerton is playing a guy named Dave Goodson, who was inspired by John Orr. We're looking, it seems to be my wheelhouse right now is, is toxic masculinity and... And, you know, white grievance politics and just looking at that through these weird little stories I find. I'm down with that because, you know, <laughs> you have a really big audience. So the more you can do that, please, by all means, keep doing I, it. I don't, do I? I think yes, I have a you do. audience. I think yeah, I you do. We sell but, a lot of your books, my friend. We sell a <laughs> lot of your books, oh which we are quite happy to do. That's great. Did nine-year-old Dennis ever think he was going to have the language to talk about toxic masculinity or racism no. or... The stuff that made you uncomfortable that the adults were, you know, sort of poo-pooing, you know, every set of kids has adult, you know, yeah. the adults are poo-pooing what you're thinking because kids notice everything. I know, I know. Everything. Yeah. And the adults are like, oh, no, you're just imagining that. And you're like, no, actually, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, we know, we know. No, I never expected any of this. And I think mm-hmm. that 
I'm still very much as an artist, a little kid, very much. I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe these lunatics pay me. I keep feeling they're going to come along and go, what were we thinking? So I'm just having fun while the ride lasts. And, and I would say that everybody who works with me um, knows that about me. They'll back that up. That assessment is that I'm just like, my dad's got a barn. Let's put on a show like that attitude. <laughs> Everything I do. It is an incredibly difficult job if you do it right. But every time I hear anybody complain about it, all I can think in my head is my father worked for Sears and Roebuck for 35 years. I am pretty sure the bloom came off that rose after like week two. He got no fulfillment from his job. He got fulfillment from bringing the money home from that job and putting it on the table so that he invested in the college fund. But the job itself, hell no. So I get to do something I love and get paid for it. It's it's incredible to me, mind boggling. And the idea that we can connect ourselves to story and to other people through story and other experiences. Like I cannot stress how much I think Small Mercies is also just a really important book because of what you're doing here. And yeah, it's wildly entertaining. And I don't think Mary Pat Fantasy is going to leave me anytime soon. And I'm still processing what that means for me as a reader. Yeah. But it's kind of the perfect package of context and history and rage and everything else that you're feeling. But I did not want to leave this story. I did not want to leave the story for a second. And that's the highest praise. I mean, I'm the bastard child of pulp and literary influences. There right. is no question. Right. And, and I cannot shake either. So it's kind of like sometimes the pulpy crowd will be like, you know, you're being a little you know you're talking about language or you know and, and sometimes the literary crowd is like we don't want to let you in our clubhouse because you know you were influenced by you know the parker novels of uh, richard stark so my absolute object is i want to make things that are vastly entertaining and then underneath them have something that if you go back a second time you're like oh my goodness whoa or that they're speaking very vibrantly about something that's important i hope but I don't want to make the equivalent of a Bergman film. That's not my jam. I want to make The Crying Game. I want to make Apocalypse Now. I want to make wildly entertaining things that are also, there's a lot of meat on the bone. You can think about them after and after. And, you know, to me, I've always, I, I truly feel like The Crying Game is the perfect movie because it's incredibly entertaining. You can't predict anywhere where it's going at any point. And yet it says so much about the Irish character, about the Irish political situation, about, about what it is to be Irish, to be honest with you. Um, and it's all in this wonderfully entertaining, crazy package. And I just, that to me is, is what, I, what I wanted to do at Small Mercies. I wanted to tell, I, I could have written, com, I guess, a type of common ground, but that's not my skill set. My skill set is tell you this, story of mortal events as um, I don't know co quote McCarthy left and right here today but yeah I like stories of mortal event with really high stakes and I think you're not alone in that do you miss Mary Pat in this world do you think I mean there's certainly not another book specifically in this this exact world mm -mm. but like mm -hmm. I could see Bobby in 10 years, maybe like the eighties. I, I only know this from this point mm -hmm. on now that there's rumors going around that this is my last book. I, I'm not saying it's not, I'm not saying it is right or it isn't, but I do know this one thing. I will only write a book from a place of extreme urgency ever again. I'm not going to write a book just to write a book. I'm not going to be like sitting around in a room going, Oh, what's the plot for my next book? I want to be seized by it the way this book seized me. Because this made me fall in love with writing again, writing books again, which had gotten really difficult for me. Um, screenplays got easier and easier. Books got harder and harder. I don't know exactly why that was, but but it happened. And it happened, began happening about 12 years ago. And it just got harder and harder to write books. Is that because you knew too much about writing books? Because I'm 12 years ago, you were established yeah, yeah, as yeah. A screenwriter. Awesome. So it's yeah. not like you were first starting. I mean, obviously, they're very different art forms. The way oh, you have to strip down for, you know. A and script. I think that's it. I think part of what is difficult for me is that a book, a book 
requires so many more pieces of myself that I would rather give to the people around me. You know, my focus, my emotional well-being can be affected by a book. My psychological well-being can be affected by a book. Yeah, a script, not at all. Not at all. Um, and the other thing is, is I find it very hard to describe static activity. I find it very hard to describe a room. So the way I put it is, there's a scene in Live by Night where Joe Coughlin walks into the opening of the Statler Hotel in 1927. And he walks in, and that is literally as historically accurate as you can believe. I've done a ton of research. He walks in, and there's all sorts of things going on, and I have to keep the action moving as he moves in looking for somebody, but also show you what's going on around him. That scene took me two weeks to write. This, that, took me two weeks to write. Everybody thought it was the scene with the plane diving on the boat. And I was like, that took me like an afternoon. That scene took me so long to write. And then you look at it, if, if it was a script, it's interior ballroom day. Night, I'm sorry, night. Joe moves through the room. And you let set designers deal with it. And you let art directors deal with it. You know, that's easy. So there is a fact, part of this that's easy. And it doesn't tax me in the same way. Is Small Mercies going to be adapted for the screen? Yeah, by me. Okay. Can you give them one direction, please, which is practice the accents? Me. Practice the act. No, you're not. Are you doing the- I'm the doing the whole thing. The vocal coaching? <laughs> I'm, I'm show running it. I'm doing okay. everything. Whoever I'm that working is with is going to be well coached. Um, Thank you very much. Because sometimes you hear people trying to do the accent and you're like, no, please, Oh, no. Please. You know so what well. I'm talking. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, oh, God, yeah. No, painful. we-, we um, <laughs> Paul Walter Hauser right now, he's been texting me, he, who plays Larry. He's right now in Boston shooting a movie. And he's like, he's like, dude, how do I do this accent? And I'm and he's he's working with a coach. But I the thing I said to him, which is very important, is the Boston accent is an amputation. And the mistake that people make is they drag it. They yes. say, car, never, I'm never going to that car. And what it is is I'm never going to the car. It's fast. It's quick. It's like, chop, chop, chop. chop. I, I've given him that, so I hope his accent is good. I get a little homesick for the accent because it also represents my childhood more than anything because a lot of folks have lost the accent, have actively worked to lose the accent. Yeah. And, you know, I I just, it makes me think of being a kid again and, you know, Nantasket Beach. and Oh, Nantasket. Beach and all Come of on. that, right? Like, you know, Pack? I mean, Come on. What are you talking about, kid? Right. The accent. Um, I miss I, it. I miss it. Yeah. I, I, uh, it comes out for me when I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like that. Uh, it's still there. So I had some babysitters I really loved who had the accent and I would mimic them and my parents would just say, mm hmm. And no, shake it because, no, and, don't. and so I never really got to slide into it, but I, I'm very fond of it. <laughs> I do. I miss hearing it. Me and a kid, me and a buddy of mine down on the end of my street. And two people, and I'll never forget it. And they, uh, one of them had California plates got in a car accident. <laughs> and the woman got out and she said to the guy, who had, look what you did to my car. And me and my friend burst out laughing. We were like, she said car. She said, <laughs> we were making fun of her for perfectly pronouncing a word because we'd never heard it that way in our lives. You know, it's a wild place. Boston yeah. in the 70s, but you did a really amazing job capturing so many different pieces of it in a way that I just, I want everyone to read this book. I really do. And especially yeah. if you read Common Ground, I really want you to read this book. I want everybody to read this book too. There's so much there and Mary Pat and even the guy that immediately I was just like Whitey Bulger. I, you <laughs> know, when you grow up with the legend of Whitey Bulger, right? Like it was so disappointing. I was like, really? They found him in Santa Monica? Mm -hmm. The farmer's market or something like what? This is Whitey Bulger, isn't he supposed to be running there's across a lot Europe? Of, there's a lot of question as to how they found him. But yeah, yeah he was well, in Santa Monica. But here's the thing. Yeah. Whitey Bulger is in Santa Monica. He kept mostly to himself. Yeah. The one thing that a guy remembers about him more than anything, who would who would kind of get in walks with him sometimes to the pier and back because he yeah. lived not far from the pier. The one thing the guy remembered was he was a virulent racist. Yeah, well, there you go. That's what, that's the only thing that stood out. Yeah, so you don't really top Whitey Bulger, so I'm going to let you go, Dennis. Thank you so Thank much. You. Small Mercies is out now. Dennis Lehane, it is always great to see you. Thank you again for everything. Thank you for everything. Take care. Hi, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Small Mercies. 
I'm Mark coming to you from my Barnes and Noble in Cincinnati, and I am joined by my book buddy, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Mark. I'm Jamie. I'm coming to you from my Barnes and Noble in Leawood, Kansas. So we're going to jump right in. I'm always excited for a new Dennis Lehane, but it made me think of an author who also has a knack for removing the veneer of like a small town life and uncovering some corruption. And that is William Kent Kruger. I wanted to recommend Iron Lake, which is the first book in his Cork O'Connor series. This is a character who you grow with. You meet him at essentially a rock bottom situation. And as he jumps into some mysteries and sticks his nose in where it doesn't belong, you just kind of fall in love with him. This series takes place in northern Minnesota. So you have some elements of indigenous uh, culture that sort of become entwined with the small community in which Cork is living. So you first meet Cork. He is in a rut. He has just been fired from his job as a sheriff. His wife has kicked him out of the house. He is not sleeping. He is smoking way too much. This man is in a right rut. He doesn't know where he's going with this. But he learns of a disappearance of a small boy, a teenage boy, in his neighborhood. And his curiosity and his instincts as a former sheriff really kick in the gear. And he starts poking around. Probably shouldn't be. Maybe does it a little clumsily from time to time, but his heart is in the right place. And he ends up on this dark road of deep-seated corruption and blackmail and murder and really gets wrapped up into something that he didn't expect. Like I said, he feels almost like if Dennis Lehane were to take place in the woods. Um, he has sort of a more rural vibe. But I think both of their writing styles really lend to personal struggles, a sense of community, as well as a solid crime mystery. So please check out William Kent Kruger in all of his forms, but starting with Iron Lake is a great place to jump in. So Jamie, what do you have for us? Well, I have to say uh, Iron Lake is great, especially to sell in the Midwest. <laughs> it's always easy to sell that one to customers. I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, that series as well. All right. So... Turning my thoughts back, though, to Dennis Lehane, I'm going to talk about The Friends of Eddie Coyle by George V. Higgins, which was published in 1970. And it's considered um, by Dennis Lehane, in fact, and many other writers uh, to be a seminal crime novel. And in fact, Elmore Leonard calls it the greatest crime novel. And I think that's a pretty big endorsement because uh, El Elmore Leonard is definitely no slouch. Like Small Mercies, this one's set in 1970s Boston. It's just a few years before the explosive events of Lehane's book. And this is a book about working class criminals. It's really about the rat race of everyday criminal life. So Eddie Coyle and his friends are, these guys are not top dogs. They are not the Corleone family or chieftains of Boston's Irish mob. Instead, these are kind of the random petty thieves and bank robbers and gun dealers who've cropped up to support those businesses. So it's not your typical uh, high stakes crime novel. It's really about these day-to-day -day relationships of these guys, right? These worker bees. Um, so Eddie Coyle is a guy who lives on the periphery. He's kind of useless, <laughs> but half connected and trying really hard to stay out of jail. Um, he's got a sentencing hearing looming, and he wants to keep his family off welfare if he ends up having to go to prison. And so he approaches a federal officer that he has informed to in the past about some rumors he's been hearing around machine guns. He's a gun dealer. And in the hopes that this cop will put in a good word for him with the prosecutor on his case. But the info he passes on is kind of second hand and incomplete and the cops draw some pretty flawed conclusions about the information that he gives them and eddie ends up caught in the machinery of these federal police versus the organized crime in boston really it's a pretty straightforward crime story and it's a really quick read but what makes it stand out for me is the dialogue of the characters because it's just fascinatingly real so george v higgins worked as a criminal lawyer and he picked up the faulty logic and the never ending banter of these guys and it's just flawless reading. In fact, most of the novel is made of dialogue. It's almost all conversations and it feels so completely real 
and so fascinating, um, even when it's completely inane, <laughs> uh, that you can't put it down. It, it ends up being charming uh, in spite of itself. It, it kind of reminded me of, of like a 1970s version of Dashiell Hammett, um, although there are no real good guys in the Friends of Betty Coyle. I think, uh, too, if you're a fan of the HBO series, The Wire, everybody's a fan of The Wire, right? So this book would remind you of that entire season of The Wire where they're trying to get a wire up on Barksdale's crew. <laughs> And in their moment of triumph, they hear a man confessing and it turns out it's to the mercy killing of a dog and not the big collar that they'd been dreaming of. This book absolutely reminded me of that season of that show. There's a bonus movie too. Speaking of page to screen, there's a bonus movie version um, that they did in 1974 and it stars Robert Mitchum and Peter Boyle and a few other familiar faces. Um, and we sell the Criterion collection of that in our stores. So again, that's the Friends of Eddie Coyle. Such a good pick. Uh, that is pretty much perfect. Uh, I couldn't have thought of a better one. And that book is, you're right, the dialogue is a masterclass. I, I really, really love it. Nice choice. No big shocker. But that's all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Jamie. You can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Bye, Mark. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.